Welcome to the MAM Journals. Today I'm going to be talking about the Suzuki DL650 XT. Now some of you might remember that I bought this virtually a year ago as my winter bike. So one of the questions I'm going to be answering in this video is how has it worked out and am I happy with my choice and my decision at that time? The second thing I'm going to briefly touch on is I went to the NEC Motorcycle Live show and one of the things that particularly struck me during the course of that show was that this mid-sized adventure bike sector is getting pretty exciting and there's a couple of new entrants. So with the new entrants arriving, do I think that the V-Strom 650 still has a part to play? I hope that you enjoy the video. So what was I looking for when I decided that I wanted to get a winter bike? Well, for me, it's got to be a bike that's easy to ride in inclement conditions, whether it be cold or wet. It's got to have a, an engine configuration that isn't too much power because um, that's not necessarily helpful in those sort of conditions. And I like something engine and gearbox wise that's nice and flexible. It needs to be a bike that's not too precious um, because it is going to get some mud and spray all over it. And probably certainly in the UK, it's going to get a fair amount of salt as well. The bike obviously needs to be comfortable to ride when you're fully laden with your waterproof gears. And also I like the instrumentation and the switch gear to be such that I can operate it with thick gloves on uh, without inadvertently placing any, touching any of the wrong buttons. Of course, it also needs to be a bike that's capable of withstanding the salt in the UK without rotting in front of your eyes. So before we talk about the specifics and how I've got on riding it, let's just remind ourselves of the specification of this bike. Right, so this is a 2021 Suzuki V-Strom DL650 XT. It's a 645cc V-twin liquid-cooled twin spark. The actual engine was, I think from memory, developed, I think it was the old SV650 engine it was based on, which was 1999. The this model actually, the V-Strom came out in 2004 in the small version. Um, this particular variant of it, because obviously they developed it over time, is a 70 brake horsepower, 62 newton meters of torque engine, produces the 78,800, so towards the upper end of its revs, but the torque is at 6,300 revs. The bike does um, according to the book, 67 miles to gallon, but I'll be honest, I don't get that. I get more like 57 miles to gallon, but that for me is perfectly acceptable um, for a, a, a winter bike, which I use enthusiastically, but within reason. The bike itself is quite tall. Uh, it's 32.9 in terms of inches seat height, but it's actually quite a narrow seat, um, and therefore it it, it doesn't feel as tall as the numbers would suggest. It, I, I've not got particularly large inside leg, 29 and a half, something like that, and I'm actually okay with it. I can get contact either side, which is quite useful in, in say, loose conditions or, or wet conditions. The bike is, well, a bit like me, um, slightly overweight, but not clinically obese in so much as it's 476 pounds so there are in the sector there are bikes that are lighter than this but there are also bikes that are heavier um, the xt has got spoked wheels on um, so that's got 19 inch at the front and a 17 inch at the back um, the xt also has the hand guards which are um, useful and i've actually also fitted oxford heated grips to it which I'll I'll give you some feedback as I talk about riding the bike it's got fairly limited electronics on the bike it has obviously got ABS as is required by legislation uh, you can't actually turn this well technically you can't turn this off but there is a way of fooling the system for those that are so inclined um, it's got basic traction control one two and off and it has some wind protection with the, the with a small screen as you can see on this bike i fitted a top box for some of my life stuff as i'm carrying it around because i do use it as a bit of a work tool in the summer as well as my winter bike and i've actually fitted a quad lock for phones and maps so that i can um, get lost with the benefit of digital assistance as opposed to just doing it on my own this bike new costs 
And this is important when we, when we get to the latter part of the video, when we're thinking about what the new ones cost. This, the list of this is 8799 for the XT version. I guess it would cost a couple hundred pounds to put it on the road. So the official price would be circa 9,000 pounds. But I'd be very surprised if you couldn't buy one of these brand new for eight and a half thousand pounds and one of the base versions, i.e. without the engine guard cover, the spoked wheels and the hand guards for circa eight. Right, so how have I got on riding the bike? Well, I've done about 2,000 miles since I bought it, so I think that's a you know sufficient mileage to have a pretty clear opinion on how effective it's been for me. I've ridden it a little bit in the summer, mostly in the cold and mostly in the wet. So it's uh, it's been it's been doing what I bought it to do, and my average journey is about a hundred miles. I've ridden all sorts of roads, little lanes, B roads, with and without potholes, um, dual carriageways, and occasionally uh, on a motorway. It copes with all of it well. It has got a very flexible engine. Some bikes are quite particular about what revs and what gear you're in. Um, I, I think the, the V-Strom is suitably ambivalent about that, which makes it a great winter bike. You don't have to worry about um, getting the precision of your riding, which is more difficult in cold conditions than you do um, in perhaps the summer when you're pressing on a bit. It has proved very reliable as a bike, but in fairness, I'd expect it to. But when I buy a bike, I often, first I read published tests, I watch YouTube videos, and I also join groups and forums which have got owners on explaining and talking about their experiences. Um, the V-Strom group is um, both very helpful and on occasions hilarious, um, and, but it gives you some idea about the reliability questions, and I do exaggerate to make the point, but things like, well, I've done 80,000 miles, do you think I should change the oil now? Um, tells you that these bikes are certainly very rugged and do do a lot of work. I've actually seen one Speedo photograph um, on a bike that looked in fairly good condition that had done 140,000 miles. So I think it's been, it's a well-tested, proven and reliable engine. The bike starts every time, which um, in fairness, um, I've got a couple of V-twins in the garage here, which unless you, they are reading perfectly in terms of battery charge, you won't be going anywhere in a hurry. And I've not actually even bothered to put a battery tender on this because even with a slightly low battery, I press the button and it fires up. So, which is important if you're going to have a winter bike. You don't want something that's temperamental and doesn't like cold weather to start because you'll quickly lose patience with it. I've actually only done minimum maintenance on the bike. Um, all I do really is the chain lube and adjustment um, since the, uh, for the year that I've owned it. And obviously I've cleaned it fairly regularly, which we'll, we'll touch on because that's important in terms of finish. The Suzuki hand shields do a reasonable job in keeping the wind from your hands, but I'm certainly glad that I went to the expense of fitting the Oxford heated grips which are very efficient and have a very wide range of temperature. I've actually got two Suzuki's which have got the factory fitted heated grips. And I would say that the Oxford is actually both warmer and has more range. Although in fairness, the OEs are, are perfectly adequate. So that was a good move. Suspension on the standard bike is fairly soft, verging on plush, I would say, which actually suits riding in, in certainly wet or um, more difficult conditions. Uh, I think I would say about this bike that it, it's, it's not really a serious off-roader. You can use it for dirt tracks and like sort of trails, but I think if you're looking for a bike to take off any sort of road, road area, um, I think there's other bikes that are better than this. Possibly the Yamaha Tenere, or certainly the KTM range is pretty flexible. But the bike itself, with this plush suspension, it's very easy to ride, it's very comfortable. Some of you might have noticed it's got nitrons on, um, which is great in the summer because I just stiffen up the suspension and, and, and it really does handle surprisingly well. And I've softened it off more in line with the factory fittings and uh, suspension settings when I ride it in the winter. Now, 70 brake horsepower is probably 
Um, one of the slower of my bikes that I've got here in the garage, but there it is enough performance to comfortably keep up with traffic. It will apparently get to three figures um, quite easily. And um, according to road test, it will do 120 miles per hour um, for the patient amongst you. It's got a, the top box has worked really well. It does carry all my practical things in there and I've got good space on it. And I'm pleased with the practicality of the bike. Personally, I wouldn't tour or regularly ride two up on the, on the Beastron. I have other options here in the garage that will do that. Um, but it is capable of doing both of those. But clearly, the more weight that you um, put on the bike, the less performance you can expect. For what I want, the bike has performed very well. And I guess we need to get back to that other question. Did it cope with the salt? So this is what I do with the bike. Uh, I give it an initial rinse off with the jet wash. I get some stroke, most of the dirt off, and I then shampoo the bike, being careful to use the sponge on the painted parts and screens and the cloth on the engine and the wheels. I've used jet washers for over 40 years, and I've learned over that time where to point them and where not to point them and from what distance. And I can honestly say, certainly in the last 30 years, I have had no problems. I also use on this particular bike, the alkaline intense cleaning fluid that um, is available, there's various brands, but I am very careful with it as to both what I put it on and how long I allow it to rest. Um, certainly follow the instruction very carefully if you're using this. Uh, it, it is quite um, capable of damaging finishings on bike unless you follow the instructions very clearly. Strong stuff. I then make sure that I rinse the bike off thoroughly with cold water. So what we're going to do now is let's have a look at the bike and in particular the finish areas which I was concerned about which are exhaust rusting, paintwork and spokes. So let's start with the spokes. These are alloy rims with nickel plated spokes. Um, frankly, they would be better with stainless steel, um, but I guess that's a budgeting expense decision. Um, but they have, they're holding up pretty well, but you do have to keep on top of them and they'd certainly benefit from a slightly more intensive cleaning regime than the one that I prepared to do. The exhaust has kept pretty well. I've spray, I, what I tend to do is I spray the bike with WD-40 in between sort of washes and running. And that's done a reasonable job in, in keeping it up together. Finally, the paint on Suzuki's, and um, in my opinion, is pretty soft and does mark pretty easily. And obviously, if you're getting on and off a bike with heavy gear and you've got... Um, lots of clips, belts, buckles and various other things, then it, it is something that has marked up. I think black is a particularly soft colour in the first place, whichever manufacturer um, you're actually with, but it has it has marked it up. So it's not it's not been perfect. I think the the cautionary tales from forums and from test reviews about finish are fair, but they're not something that I, I've been overly disappointed in. I would sort of give it a 7 out of 10 in regard to finish with a little bit of control and if a bit more care I could have probably made it even better but I think it's been okay. Overall I view the bike as a winter bike in terms of what I tried to buy, what I was trying to achieve, I think it's an 8 or 9 out of, out of 10. So that to me is a tick in the box. That's a hit. So if that's answered the first of my two questions posed at the beginning, i.e. is it a good winter bike? My second question is, are the new bikes that are entering the market going to really supersede the requirements and needs of the 650 and be surpassed? Let's have a look at the ones that are actually coming. The Honda is launching or relaunching a brand called the Transalp bike. That's a 750cc parallel twin that produces over 90 brake horsepower and 75 newton meters of torque. 
it's got lots of technology and uh, certainly attracted a lot of attention at the show when we were there. They've yet to announce what the price point is, but I'd be surprised if it's going to be significantly less than £10,000. Certainly, if it is, I think it's a bike that will attract a great deal of attention and sell well. Suzuki, of course, have introduced the new DL800, another parallel twin. The bike produces 83 brake horsepower and, and 78 newton meters of torque, so significant improvements on the V-Strom. And, of course, it has improved technology, both in terms of um, TFT screens, functionality in terms of modes, and it actually comes with a um, quick shifter both up and down. And I think the Suzuki's uh, offer in that particular space of the market is very competent. They make good gearboxes. The bike has been priced at 10.499, so quite a big differential between that and the V-Strom, which they're running parallel in sales for 2023. Yamaha's offering is um, less new to the market. The Tenere has been around for a little while, but it's certainly well regarded and probably outsells the current V-Strom, particularly for those that want to actually genuinely go um, more off-road than just trails or light gravel tracks. It's a more mechanical bike. And it's quite a bit taller than the V-Strom, which doesn't suit everybody, um, but has good off-road capabilities and good ground clearance. That bike is priced at just under £10,000. So will these new bikes be better? To be honest, of course they will. They've spent money and time developing them and technology improves all the time. How much better? Well, we'll know when we've tested them. But in the meanwhile, as I say, Suzuki are offering both a new model and the existing V-Strom. Now, some people will be slightly cynical over this and just say, well, they're just selling the old units to get rid of them. Um, and others, uh, there is an argument saying, well, actually, they're offering two spaces in the market. Because the reality is, the V-Strom, depending on which model you go for, is between 20 and 25% less money new than some of the other offerings in the marketplace. And I think for that sort of money, you get an extremely competent, capable, reliable bike that's a lot faster than it looks. Anyway, I do hope that you've enjoyed this video and that you found it useful and interesting. If you have, perhaps you'd be kind enough to press either like or subscribe if you've enjoyed it sufficiently to do so. Uh, but regardless of whether you do any of that, ride safe, stay well.